The ground shakes and you hear a loud cracking sound. Oh no, the dome is failing. Everyone runs to their skate pods to evacuate. People are pushing and shoving. The Earth-like atmosphere in the dome is going to be compromised, and you'll be exposed to the thin elements on the surface of Mars. Everyone rushes to put their helmets on. The crack is getting bigger by the second, and people are panicking, trying to get on the escape shuttles as quickly as possible. In the chaos, they all jam into the wrong ships, and there isn't any room for you. Red warning lights begin to flash in the dome, and a voice rings out, telling everyone to put their helmets on. The Martian atmosphere is only minutes away from rushing in, and humans won't be able to breathe otherwise. This is just your luck. You only just arrived on Mars. As the ships zoom off into the distance, you wonder what you should do. You call out for help, but no one answers. Suddenly, a robot guide rolls up behind you, and you hear a faint noise coming from its speakers. It says, no one can hear you because the atmosphere on Mars is so much less dense than on Earth. It also has a lot of carbon dioxide, which absorbs sound waves. Even if a loud concert was happening just 30 feet away, it would sound like it was miles away. Would you like me to assist you with anything? You ask it for help, and it shows you a 3D layout of the entire dome. You can see a few other shuttle stations, so you decide to aim for them. Unfortunately, you're going to need to get to the opposite side of the dome to reach another shuttle station. Just as you begin to panic and wonder how you could get there, the robot transforms into a bike and tells you to hop on. You get in and cruise through the city, looking at all the empty buildings and streets. The crack is getting even bigger, and tiny pieces of the dome begin to fall from above, like snow. When you arrive at the other station, the last few people are boarding the only shuttle. You chase after them, desperately trying to get their attention. As you ding the bell on your bike, though, it barely makes any noise at all. Their ship pulls away before they can notice you. You ask why sounds aren't working, and the robot explains that you can barely hear high-pitched noises on Mars. The carbon dioxide makes high-pitched noises, like bells and chirping birds, almost impossible to hear. If only you were still on Earth, they might have noticed you. The robot tells you that there's one last chance to escape. He transforms into a tiny spaceship. You get in, and he flies through the crack in the dome out into space. It's going so fast that you should be back on Earth before long. Just as you're starting to relax and enjoy the sights of space, you see a red light flashing on the robot. You ask it what's wrong, but you get no response. Suddenly, you realize that you can't hear anything in space. Sound travels in waves, and it needs something to move through, like air or water. Space is a vacuum with no air, so you can't hear any sounds at all. The spaceship suddenly changes direction and blasts off away from Earth. You try to steer the robot in the right direction, but you can't figure out how to get its attention. The ship charts a flight all the way to Venus. As you get closer, the turbulence kicks in. Venus has winds faster than any tornado on Earth. You keep getting swept away, trying to find a safe space to land in. The robot manages to keep a steady course, despite the wind throwing it all over the place. You can already feel the heat through all the layers. Finally, the robot spots a small cave in the distance and attempts to land there. As soon as the robot touches ground, it morphs into a spacesuit you can wear, so you're safe in the extreme environment. Today's forecast in Venus? Heat. Extremely boiling temperatures all day and night. Expect clouds of sulfuric acid and gale force winds. The atmosphere is mainly made up of carbon dioxide, so you can expect your voice to drop deeper too because of the planet's dense atmosphere. It's only the second planet closest to the sun, but it's actually the hottest. Its atmosphere traps the heat from the sun and keeps it around the planet. It's actually so hot on Venus that it could melt lead. If you were cruising by with the spaceship, the whole thing would melt in a matter of minutes. Luckily, you have this indestructible robot armor. You try to ask the robot how to get back, and your voice sounds crazy. Your vocal cords vibrate slower here than on Earth, which makes the pitch lower. But at the same time, the speed of sound on Venus is a lot faster, making it more squeaky. Then, the high carbon dioxide content in the air creates a weird effect that tricks your brain into thinking that the sound source is small. Overall, you sound something like a cartoon duck. You look out across the horizon and see many hills and mountains scattered across the plain. But the robot tells you that many of these are volcanoes. Venus actually has more volcanoes than any other planet in the solar system. 
scientists discover more than 1,600 only on the surface, which could mean there are even more than that still undiscovered. Yeah, maybe being here all day isn't such a good idea. And not just because of the heat. A single day on Venus lasts 243 Earth days. In fact, a day on Venus is longer than a year, because it only takes 225 days for it to complete a rotation around the Sun. It's hard to understand each other, but you eventually manage. The robot tells you that it just got lost, and that you'll be back on Earth in no time. While walking around the cave, you realize that you're actually inside a volcano. You tell the robot to hurry up and get you back home before it erupts. It's clearly not very good at navigating space, though, because it's not long before you end up somewhere else. You're now on Titan, Saturn's largest moon. The moon is so large that it's even bigger than Mercury, the planet closest to the sun. The spaceship arrives in the atmosphere, which feels and behaves similar to Earth's. The only noticeable difference is the orangey haze hanging in the air, which makes it a lot more difficult to see. As you descend towards the moon, the robot detects signs of cyanide gas all over the surface and fluffy clouds made out of iced methane. You land on a soft spot and set about trying to get the robot to take you back to the right place. At least this time, you're not sweating. The robot transforms again and begins to scan the surroundings. The atmosphere is around 60% thicker than on Earth. Walking around feels like you're wading through maple syrup. There is a really high nitrogen content in the air, so things sound surprisingly similar to how they do on Earth. You tell the robot you really want to get home now but it comes out as a loud, raspy shout. This is because Titan has more nitrogen than Earth, and because sound travels a bit slower. Luckily, you can still understand each other here. The robot tells you that it needs to absorb a bit more energy from its solar panels before taking off. So you have a look around. This moon is one of the only things in the solar system that has fixed bodies of liquid like rivers, lakes, and seas on its surface. You can understand why the robot got lost now, given how similar Titan is to Earth. Titan even has liquid cycles, with rain, evaporation, and condensation. This isn't water, like back on Earth, though. The main liquid here is methane. Scientists think that there may be volcanic activity, but instead of molten hot lava spewing out, it's water. Other planets, like Mars, have ice on the peaks of their mountains and evidence of water beneath the surface. But nothing is as close to Earth as Titan. Some scientists believe that this moon could be our next home billions of years from now. The Sun's temperature will increase by then, making the Earth's atmosphere uninhabitable. By then, Titan's cool temperatures will be good enough to create stable oceans and sustain life. The robot finally gathers enough electricity to fly away, so you can head home. It'll be nice to have a normal conversation where your voice doesn't sound like an exaggerated cartoon. It's just a regular day. As usual, you're taking a shower before starting to get ready for work. Everything is going as planned. Until it isn't. One clumsy move, some water spilled on the floor, and you're flapping your arms in the air, your body nearing the floor with frightening speed. Everything goes black. First thing you hear is a high-pitched whining in your head. Ouch, your head. Ugh. You carefully get up. There's no blood, and that's good. An even better thing is that the annoying noise stops abruptly. Holding your head, you leave the bathroom and almost stumble over your cat, Milo. He hisses, and then a clear voice in your head says, Clumsy loser. Huh? You whip your head around in fear, but you see no one. It's just you and Milo? You've probably hit your head more than you thought. You shrug and make your way to the kitchen. Milo follows you. You hear ceaseless grumbling. Why can he sleep in the bedroom and I'm banned from there? Why haven't I gotten my meal yet? This leather creature's too lazy. Shall I scratch the sofa or leave a mouse on his pillow? The first thought that comes to your mind is, we have mice in the house? The second is more relevant. I'm losing my marbles. Great! Acting on autopilot, you pour some milk into Milo's bowl and fill another one up with some dry food. The cat doesn't seem to be satisfied with how fast you are. If his, oh for goodness sake, move it, man, is anything to go by. Okay, 
now you'll have to live with the knowledge that your beloved cat Milo actually has the personality of a grumpy old man. Duh. You decide to lock yourself in the bathroom again because you're starting to get overwhelmed. You sit down heavily on the toilet lid and almost jump a foot in the air when you hear someone arguing loudly. After looking around, you find out that, apparently, there are not only mice, but also cockroaches in your house. Just great. At the moment, you're staring at a couple of these insects, which seem to be having a fight. At least, one of them is accusing the other of... Wait, what? Cheating? You've heard enough. You're about to dash out of the bathroom when you hear a bang. In the living room, you find your cat on the floor under a smashed flower pot. The worst thing? He seems to be really hurt. He won't stop whimpering and meowing. Ugh, it hurts! It hurts! My paw! Ouch! Ouch! But the sofa can't remain unscratched today. You grab Milo, shove him into the carrier. Hey, watch out, you leather bag! And head for the clinic. On the way... You have to concentrate hard to block out the noise of countless voices assaulting you. The waiting area at the vet is full. Uh Uh-oh, you're in for a long wait. Half an hour later, your head is ready to explode. You found out that that yellow python is suspiciously interested in the hamster a girl in the corner is clutching to her chest. So fat, so pretty. The hamster's worried about his stash of nuts. Where did I hide them? Where, where, where? A tiny dog that has come with an elderly lady is anxious about needles. Ah, If that shop thingy comes near me once again, they'll regret it. I'll destroy everyone on my way. Finally, it's your turn. The vet invites you to her office, and you bend to pick up Milo when a desperate-looking young man bursts into the room. My puppy! What's wrong with him? The vet looks at you apologetically, but you're focused on the puppy. It looks weak, but you manage to figure out the words, Chocolate! Yum! When you tell the vet and the anxious owner that the pooch has eaten some chocolate, which is basically poison for dogs, they give you a funny look and disappear into the doctor's office. Sometime later, the guy exits, holding the dog that looks way better than before. When they leave, the vet turns to you. How did you figure out the dog had eaten chocolate? Uh Uh-oh, here it comes. You decide that honesty is the best strategy and tell the vet that you can understand what animals say. Of course, she doesn't believe you. You have to try hard to persuade her. But with the help of two other dogs, Milo and an elderly squirrel, you manage to make her believe you. When you get back home, your head is spinning and you're pretty hungry. All you can think about is some fried eggs and bacon. Yum. Wait, bacon? But it's, uh uh-oh. Apparently, starting today, you're a vegan. Anyway, that's when it starts. You don't know how it happens, but you become famous overnight. The next morning, a loud noise wakes you up, and it doesn't sound like animals talking to you. You look out of the window and see crowds of people gathered around your house. Some of them are reporters, but others are pet owners that have come to ask you for help. Milo is not happy. While grumbling nonstop and calling you names, he bites your leg and retreats under the stairs. And you go out of your house to talk to people and answer the reporter's questions. In the evening, you're exhausted, but also happy. You've saved several animals today. They had serious health and psychological problems their owners couldn't figure out on their own. Lying in bed in the dark, you think of how you can use your ability. That's when your plan takes shape. Soon, you become the most renowned animal care specialist in the world. You listen to animals talking about their problems, talk them out of depression, and help them resolve misunderstandings with their owners. TV shows invite you for interviews. Your YouTube channel is growing every day. People recognize you on the street and ask you to take pictures with them. You travel the world, help endangered species, and give lectures. You open vet clinics all over the globe and invite the best professionals to work there. 
you never feel lonely. There's always someone to talk to or listen to. At least, some birds when you're walking in the park, or some fish when you're having a rare moment of rest on the beach. At the same time, you've come to realize how many animals are begging for help, but no one can hear them. You decide to take up the role of their speaker. It turns out you're now famous not only in the human world, but also in the world of animals. They're grateful, and in return, they start informing you of different natural disasters that are about to happen on the planet. You've heard that animals can predict earthquakes or volcanic eruptions. And if before, people had to try hard to notice some unusual behavior of certain species, now animals just pass you information about what's going to happen and where. With time, you notice that you spend less time among people and more time with animals. Together, you plan campaigns against zoos, circuses, and other places where animals are kept against their will. And then, one day, the unthinkable happens. You're returning home when a black van stops next to you. A few big mask guys grab you and push you inside. The doors close behind your back. Inside, you find out that several influential people aren't happy with your activity you realize that this trip isn't going to end well. The guys blindfold you and lead you somewhere, but at one moment, you lose your footing and hit your head on something hard. You open your eyes. Milo is standing over you, looking at your lying body rather indifferently. And then the most terrible thing happens. He meows what sounds like a whole sentence, turns away, and walks out of the bathroom. And you don't understand a meow of what he's saying. Was it all just a dream? Hello, and welcome to the Survive No Matter What Show. Today, our host, Alberto, will perform a crazy trick. Last year, he lived in a cave with a grizzly bear for two months and managed to survive. Do you remember how Alberto smeared himself with minced meat and jumped into a pool with piranhas? I hope you haven't forgotten how Alberto grilled a barbecue on an awakened volcano. Well, forget it. Today, Alberto will do the most dangerous and crazy trick in his life. Especially for you, dear viewers, he will get swallowed by a giant blue whale. Alberto goes to the North Atlantic. It's a vast area of water where you can meet blue whales and cachalots. He gets on a yacht and sails far from the shore. He's going to look for whales using echolocation and binoculars. A few days have passed. Alberto sits on board and studies the horizon. The sonar detects some movement. He looks toward the signal and sees a water fountain rising into the sky. It's a giant blue whale, the largest mammal on the planet. Yes, it's a mammal, not a fish. So, Alberto smears himself with oil to easily squeeze into the whale's throat. He takes an oxygen mask and jumps into the water. The blue whale opens its mouth and absorbs a massive amount of water. Its mouth is filled with whale bone. These are the bristles that replace teeth. They consist of keratin protein. People's hair and nails are made of it. The whale draws in water and then pushes it out. The bristles prevent small fish and plankton from leaving the mouth along with the liquid. Whalebone is like a filter. Alberto swims closer. The whale takes a sip. It absorbs several dozen gallons of water and sucks up Alberto. Our hero is inside the storm. The water splashes in different directions and a giant tongue the size of an elephant throws Alberto on different sides. Alberto tries to get to the throat, but the water splashes back out. Alberto slides along the tongue to the mouth's exit, but the whale closes his mouth and he crashes into the whalebone. It's a little painful. A couple of bristles even fall off. The tongue wants to push him out, but Alberto manages to squeeze into its throat. But here, he meets a block. He can't go further because of the structure of the whale. This colossal animal's throat is tiny, the size of a fist, but it can stretch. Alberto had foreseen this. That's why he smeared himself with oil. He stretches out to his full height and jumps into the throat. Now our hero finds himself inside a narrow esophagus. He slides on it like a slide in a water park. Then his speed decreases. 
the space becomes narrower. Now Alberto is crawling forward with difficulty. It's very slippery here, and Alberto can barely move. The esophagus contracts and pushes Alberto further. Now he's inside the stomach. It's dark, cramped, and smells awful. Alberto wants to light a match, but his pockets are entirely wet. And it's a bad idea to make a fire here. Firstly, there's almost no oxygen, which means no chance for a fire. Secondly, various chemical reactions occur inside the stomach, creating explosive gases. Alberto doesn't want that. He takes out a flashlight and examines the place. The walls of the stomach are narrow and constantly pulsating. Alberto can't stand up to his full height. He's knee deep in some liquid. He sees skeletons of fish, shipwrecks, supermarket baskets, DVDs, a lamp, and a Moby Dick book around him. No, that's not true, as you're unlikely to find anything interesting inside a whale's stomach. Maybe a plastic bottle or some small squid. By the way, a cachalot, unlike a blue whale, has a wide and long throat. This allows it to swallow large prey whole. Technically, it can swallow a human with one sip. Anyway, you can find many exciting things in the cachalot's stomach. Once, this creature swallowed a giant squid whole. The length of these squids can reach 46 feet. That's the size of a small bus. But the cachalot managed to swallow such prey thanks to the flexible structure of the squid's body. Okay, now let's get back to Alberto. There's a terrible smell in the whale's stomach. Plankton and small fish are digested in gastric juice. And, wait, why does it hurt so much? Alberto feels the stomach juice splitting his suit. Alberto tries to get up, but it's too crowded in here. He hits the stomach walls with his hands, but nothing happens. The stomach narrows and squeezes Alberto more and more. The juice irritates his skin. Alberto shouts and waves his legs in different directions. He wants to cause a gag reflex, but it doesn't work. Alberto is desperate, and he doesn't know what to do. It seems that this is his last adventure. He closes his eyes and takes a deep breath. Stop! A deep breath! Precisely! Alberto opens the oxygen tank and fills the stomach with fresh air. Now the whale begins to bloat and is filled with gas. The stomach is throbbing, the juice is foaming, and it seems a storm is coming. The walls contract so much that they squeeze Alberto out through the esophagus. Together with the remains of fish and juice, he moves forward. The esophagus is getting narrower. Alberto finds it hard to breathe, but he sees the light at the end of the tunnel. The whale spits him out. Alberto is alive. He's happy that he managed to escape such an adventure unharmed. He returns to the boat and sails to the shore. But wait a minute. What's that swimming by right now? It's a cachalot. What a stroke of luck. Alberto dives into the water again. He's heading straight for the mouth of this huge animal. The cachalot absorbs water. Several fish and an octopus get there along with Alberto. The cachalot pushes him with its tongue in different directions and swallows all the prey. The throat is wide enough and Alberto easily manages to get there. But there's another problem. Alberto is already in a very tight esophagus where he can hardly breathe. And he doesn't have an oxygen tank. Alberto feels like he's been wrapped tightly in duct tape. He can't do anything, and there's no air here. He squeezes deep into the esophagus and feels that he is not alone here. In addition to the octopus, he feels the movements of large tentacles. Wow, it's a giant squid, and it seems it's still alive. Alberto shakes his whole body, but can't change anything. He loses consciousness. The stomach walls are pressing on his face. At this point, Alberto bites it. An earthquake begins. All that lay in the stomach comes out. Finally, Alberto is outside. A colossal squid swims away as far as possible. It seems it hasn't understood what happened to it. Our hero climbs onto the yacht. He's the happiest person on the planet right now. He starts the engine and heads to the shore. You must understand that Alberto's story is purely hypothetical. Of course, in reality, a whale wouldn't be able to swallow a human. Reports that a person ended up in a whale's stomach are overgrown with myths and legends. Yes, there were cases when people got into their giant mouths, but they didn't go through the throat. One day a diver got there, but he miraculously survived thanks to scuba diving equipment that helped him breathe.
Another case occurred with people who were kayaking. When a humpback whale catches fish, it swims up to the surface with its mouth open. It's like a grid that rises from below. Those guys on the kayaks were too close and fell into the whale's mouth. Anyway, don't worry, a whale can't swallow you. It's impossible. But it is possible for a cachalot. The good news is that this is a rare animal. The probability of getting into its stomach is one in a billion. It's more likely that a meteorite will fall near you. Most people on Earth will never see a cachalot in real life. These animals swim worldwide in open oceans, but spend most of their time at a depth of about 10,000 feet. That's 10 times the height of the Eiffel Tower, but just in the ocean. So Barry is running along the shore of a lake as fast as possible. He knows that if he stops, his life will turn into a nightmare in no time. A thousand mosquitoes are about to bite him. But what he doesn't know is that he'll be okay after all. So don't be afraid, Barry, and stop. Mosquitoes are slow. They fly at a little more than one mile per hour. (laughs) And you can't run forever. So after a couple of hours of pointless running, Barry stops. He sweats and emits a smell attractive to insects. One little mosquito flies up to him. It buzzes next to his ear, sits on his sweaty neck, and bites. The insect pierces the skin with a special mouth apparatus called a proboscis. The mosquito starts pumping blood through this needle. Its saliva gets into Barry's body and causes an allergic reaction. More precisely, it's Barry's immune system that starts this reaction. It perceives the mosquito's saliva as an enemy and sends a unique chemical substance to the bite site. The fight between this substance and the invader causes an allergic reaction redness, swelling, and the worst thing, itching. Barry can scratch himself for several hours or even days. It all depends on how his body will react to the bite. The mosquito fills up with Barry's blood and flies away. It does it not for pleasure, but because it needs to lay eggs. Protein in the blood is necessary for these insects to reproduce. Their eggs can't grow without this substance. Yeah, almost all biting mosquitoes are female. Male mosquitoes prefer plant and flower nectar. Hey, they're guys. So the female mosquito flies away from Barry. She sits down on the shore of the lake where a large mosquito base is located. Here, these insects lay eggs, drink water, and chill in the sun. There are several hundred thousand of them, and they're all hungry. The female mosquito brings with her the smell of Barry's sweat, which is attractive to the rest of the mosquitoes, too. There are about 3,500 species of these insects on Earth. Some of them love the smell of sugar, perfume, or deodorant. And some enjoy the smell of dirty feet. Mm. Now, your attractiveness to mosquitoes also depends on what you have eaten today. Lots of candies and chocolate? Great! Now, mosquitoes feel a faint sweet smell coming from you. Have you eaten garlic and onions? Mosquitoes probably won't want to deal with you. And not only they, most likely. (laughs) So, the smell of berry sweat is perfect for all mosquitoes on the shore. They go mad, take off, and head for the poor guy. If you walk near the water when the evening comes, if you're sweaty, wearing black clothes, and have O-type blood, then you have all the chances to get bitten by mosquitoes. And berry meets all the criteria. The first mosquitoes land on berry's feet. They bite him and start pumping blood. One tiny mosquito can draw a droplet of blood the size of a half a grain of rice. It's nothing at all. But several dozen of these bites? It's bad. Barry fights mosquitoes off with his hands, but the insects keep coming. They can't miss such a delicious dinner. 10, 20, 50, 100 mosquitoes. They cover Barry's legs. The skin swells and turns red. Barry feels a burning sensation. His immune system is working at 100%, trying to reduce the damage and drive the enemies away. But the more actively Barry's body defenses work, the worse he feels. Mosquitoes sit on his hands and on his wet t-shirt stuck to his body. Yes, their mouthpiece can pierce a thin layer of fabric. Barry tries to run away. He stumbles over a rock and falls. Some insects finish their feast and fly away to tell their friends about the free food. Mosquitoes from all over the lake come to try Barry. 200 mosquitoes are drinking his blood. 3, 5, 7, 900, 
Now, 1,000 mosquitoes have bitten him. Together, they have pumped out a small glass of blood. But the worst thing is, they continue biting him. Nothing can stop them now, even though they were supposed to bite him only a thousand times. Well, the only chance to escape is water. Barry, ignoring the itch, gets up and runs to the shore of the lake. Meanwhile, 100,000 mosquitoes have already bitten him. Sorry, Barry, but we have to entertain the audience. Don't worry, your recovery will be fast. He's getting closer and closer to the water. Mosquitoes are flying in front of his face, so he can't see the road. But Barry keeps running, waving his hands. Meanwhile, you know this moment when you're sleeping and one mosquito flies into the room through the window? Just one. But its squeaky sound is so annoying. And now, imagine a million mosquitoes making this noise. It's like a saxophone playing high notes. Sorry if you're a sax player. Well, Barry is slowing down. He's exhausted, and his heart is beating too fast. He no longer feels bites and itches. His body is becoming weak, but he's still moving toward the lake. Mosquitoes have already taken three soda cans of blood from him. And this is serious. Barry is running a fever and has clouded consciousness. His immune system is not coping. Barry can't run anymore. He's struggling to walk. It's getting harder to make every next step. The shore is only a few feet away, but it doesn't matter anymore since he has no energy to move. So he just sits on the grass and accepts the situation. He's lost a large soda bottle of blood, and this is a lot. This is probably the most large-scale attack of mosquitoes on humans. And then, at the very last moment, salvation appears. A frog croaks nearby, and another one. Several dozen jumping animals are approaching the shore. They release their tongues like spears and catch mosquitoes. This gives Barry hope. He makes a last-ditch effort to reach the lake. He jumps in. Yeah! What a relief! Cold, fresh water envelops his whole body and relieves the itching and irritation from the bites. He waits in the water while the frogs dine on the mosquitoes. The remaining insects fly away. Barry crawls out of the lake. He sees frogs catching mosquitoes and realizes that these annoying insects are necessary for our planet. Frogs live thanks to these tiny monsters. And besides frogs, there are many other animals that feed on mosquitoes. Lizards, spiders, bats, birds, turtles, it's a huge list. Mosquitoes are an endless source of food for them. One pair can lay 200 eggs. They grow fast and their lives are short. But if all these insects disappear, an ecological catastrophe may begin. Entire animal species may vanish from the face of the earth. The frogs that save Barry wouldn't exist. Without frogs, the population of other insects, like flies, would begin to grow. They would reproduce uncontrollably. And then, like falling dominoes, other problems will follow. So, Barry, don't be angry at mosquitoes. It's just nature. You better deal with your itchy problem. His whole body is red, covered with little bumps. He starts scratching himself, but this doesn't help. He only makes it worse. As long as mosquito saliva remains in his body and the immune system fights it, Barry will feel this itch. Fortunately, there are many oils and ointments to alleviate these effects. But the best way to get rid of the problem is to ignore it. Barry just needs to distract himself with something. Then the urge to scratch will disappear. Barry has survived so many mosquito bites without harmful consequences. But some people have problems dealing with just one. It depends on whether a person has allergies. Some have a small itchy bump, and others have severe inflammation. As for Barry, wasn't he swell? I mean, didn't he swell? (laughs) Okay, I'll stop. The best way to protect yourself is to use insect spray. Now, Barry sprays himself with this substance before every run and feels safe. But let's have a look at another situation. What if Barry gets attacked by huge dogs? Hey, just kidding. Relax, Barry. You're on vacation, taking a trip to the family estate set in the cold Scottish Highlands. An old ruined castle sits alone, a token of your family's heritage. You spent your childhood in the nearby forest chasing squirrels, and through adulthood, you have enjoyed walking every acre of it. There's always something new to be found. 
As you walk the millionth time through the trees, you find a small stone building. It's half covered in dirt and overgrown grass. Curious, you've never seen this before. You dig away at the dirt and pull away the grass, eager to learn what's within. You find a small, weather-worn door, large enough for a dog. Maybe it's a royal doghouse. You pull the old door and look inside. It's a small room with nothing in it except for an old sack. You grab the sack, taking a closer look, trying to identify the fabric. But wait a minute, there's something inside of it. You look inside and find an egg about the size of an ostrich. Hmm, dogs don't lay eggs. Looking at the egg closely, you notice it's very old and heavier than you expected. You shake it gently, feeling the sensation of liquid inside. Suddenly, you feel some energy coming from it. Shocked, you attempt to throw the egg away but stop yourself. For some reason, you feel a sense of longing towards the egg, as though it belongs to you. You hold it close, protecting it, and carry it back to the homestead. You sit by the egg, lying on the kitchen table, waiting and expecting something to happen. Your eyes become heavy, and slowly they close. Just as your eyelids touch, the egg wriggles slightly. You open your eyes in response, but the egg remains still. Did I imagine it? It wriggles again and again, and now it's constantly shaking. The egg rolls around on the table, cracks begin appearing, and something inside is hitting the shell with great ferocity, desperate to be released. Finally, the shell breaks open with an almighty thrust from the small resident. It stands with its arms stretched into the air and squeals out to the world, I am free! You look towards what should be a bird of some sort, but this is a very strange bird. Four legs, wings, reptile skin. Ah, it's a dragon. Wait, what? A dragon? Yes, a dragon. It says to you after reading your thoughts. How? What? You're struggling to find your words. You are the descendant of these holdings, are you not? You nod, confused even more because they can speak. As per the decree of 1061, we few that are laid within an egg are loyal to the caretaker side. You look at one another. The dragon is definitely waiting for some response. You are so confused, you can't utter a word. Have you chosen a name for me to which I am to respond? Ah, a name. Right, um, I will call you Dog. Dog responds by bowing honorably. It is a worthy name I hope to bring glory to. Glory? Um, I don't understand why you're here, though. Why now? Dog explains that when elements of magic within the air react, it creates a perfect environment for dragon eggs to hatch. From a scientific perspective, changes within the Earth's atmosphere could probably explain all this. Whether it's the temperature, hydrogen levels, or changes in the ocean, it's impossible to determine. You accept that it's just magic. Exhausted by the events, you head to bed. The following morning, you awake, expecting to see Dog waiting for you. He's nowhere to be found. You go outside. It's all very quiet. No birds are singing. The distant sheep are also quiet. Suddenly, Dog flies down. He's grown to the size of a cow. He's grown way too fast, though you think you know why. You try not to imagine what he's been up to. First lesson, human, get on. Dog positions himself to allow you onto his back. You don't question him, trusting that he knows what he's doing. Without warning, he begins to run fast toward an open clearing, just like an airplane, as he gathers enough speed. With the force of the wind, you both take off. You speed through the air, gaining altitude. You hold on tight. Passing through near misses between trees, Dog makes immediate turns, and you wish you were safely on the ground. You can hear Dog's voice within your head. You will act as my eyes as well, watching from where I cannot. Um, I see trees all around. There are some hills in the distance. Not now! Dog interrupts. You will look out for danger, not observe the scenery. You are flying for some hours, and you have no idea where you might be. You're too concerned about hanging on, and it's cold. You should have brought warmer clothes. Now jump! You jump without hesitation, trusting Dog's orders, but you quickly regret this move as you fall to the ground. The distant trees below are quickly becoming larger. Spread your arms out and grab on! Dog pulls in beneath. You land on top of him and grasp him immediately. Good job! We only get one try at that trick. Dog laughs. You safely land in a landscape you're unfamiliar with. Fetch some wood. We'll make camp. Annoyed at taking orders from what's meant to be your dragon, you respectfully go to collect wood as Dog flies away. You collect a good pile, all stacked neatly. 
dog lands with a sudden thud next to it. He doesn't acknowledge your hard work and starts it up with one puff. He lays peacefully and drifts off to sleep, snoring loudly straight away. You enjoy the warmth, but it's still uncomfortable on the ground. You feel it would be appropriate to lay next to dog, and he gives you a flick of his tail. Oh, man! With his eyes still closed, he grumbles, I am not furniture, I am a dragon, and goes back to sleep. You lay down elsewhere and drift off to sleep uncomfortably. As you wake up the next morning, there's hardly any warmth coming from the charcoal remains. Dog is nowhere to be found. Not surprised, you sigh, worst dragon ever. Dog arrives in his classic unexpected style and throws you some cooked meat. You don't ask where he got it. Best not to know. Eat well. Today is our biggest task. Danger approaches. Dog stands looking out towards the unknown. You eat your meal, enjoying the little something this partnership has provided. You look up and notice that Dog's size has grown twice as large overnight. You gather to his back and climb up. His wings are so large now, he doesn't need a runway and takes flight without warning. Be on the lookout today. Today is the day. As Dog rushes forward, you ask, what day? Just be focused, Dog yells. Together, you fly north. The air is cooler, but Dog's body warmth is greater today. Dark clouds form in the distance. Flying closer, you can see things in the distance, unsure to make out what they are. Dog realizes your concern. Ice boils. What? The same magic that allowed me to hatch brought them from the ice. They will want to turn the world frozen. Only we can stop them. You're concerned as you observe their numbers. There might be dozens, if not hundreds, and possibly more hiding in the clouds behind them. As you approach, Dog speeds toward them, bending them on, breathing fire and biting. You hold on tight, trying to avoid the sharp ends of their wings. Their numbers are too many. Dog is becoming overwhelmed. An ice coil from overhead speeds down, targeting Dog, realizing he's unable to do anything as he's facing several of those at once. You leap towards it. You hit it in midair. It's like hitting a stone wall. You make no effect apart from distracting it. It flicks you away and you fall. Dog sees you, but he's unable to help, so he cries out to you. You fall helpless to the ground. I've got you. You can hear a girl's voice. She grabs you by the arm, pulling you onto another dragon. You smile and then turn around to see that there isn't just one, but dozens more, all flying to save Dog. The group of dragons targets the ice coils, rescuing Dog. Then they turn to defeat the remaining ice coils. Regardless of the number of ice coils, the dragon force easily defeats them. The remaining flee even further north. The dragons and their riders land together, gathering to meet one another. Dog abruptly lands next to you. You turn to the girl that saved you. Do you get along with your dragon? You ask. What do you mean? We're best friends. She laughs and hugs her dragon. Good for you. You sigh as Dog pats you on the head.